because we've got to get this fabulous red hair situation. <laughs> red hair duo. Mine's not natural. You probably figured that out, though. <laughs> have a little help. But we got a good rainbow going on. So I'm really excited to talk with you. I watched The Hammer yesterday. I really enjoyed it. Oh, good deal. And um, I'm curious because I know that Kim Wheeler, the character you play, the judge you play in it, is based on a real person, I believe, named Kim Wanker. But I wonder if you saw any parallels in your own life because, you know, it's the woman, you know, she she has to kind of make her own way, which I know you did. You know, you you know, it was a bit of a grind before you had your success in the country market. It took a moment. Also, like, you know, she deals with some sexism and stuff and she's called a loose cannon. Like, did you see yourself in this character? I really did. Kim is a very interesting character. And the hammer is a made up story based on a true live character. Kim okay. Wanker. I'm Kim Walker in the movie. And I got okay. to visit with Kim with Judge Kim. She is a character. She's very, um, she's like a live wire. She's just electric when you're uh, listening to her. I've watched videos about her. Uh, she sent me a book about how things are out mm -hmm. in the three uh, courthouses that she runs and is a district court judge. And But a, a district court judge, <clears throat> excuse me, has been going on since the 1700s. Oh, wow. Uh, and so they quit them for a while, but because there's not that many circuit judges around that will do this. So she has to travel and co and uh, cover three courthouses in 25,000 square miles. Wow. So I'm also curious because, you know, when we talk about, you know, real life imitating art or art imitating life, whichever the way you want to put it, you, your boyfriend, Rex Lynn is in this. And I know it's not obviously the first time you've shared the screen together. You, you share the screen together like 30 years ago and you do in Big Sky. But, you know, this was a little different than playing husband, wife and Big Sky. Like, what was it like to have him be the mysterious cowboy in this uh, film? Well, I thought it was really neat. And he made a very handsome, mysterious cowboy, too. <laughs> And if we, it, he helped me tremendously. Um, other than doing Young Sheldon and my show, memorizing the lyrics of my songs, I was a little rusty on my acting mm. uh, memorization. And Rex is really into rehearsal. So we would rehearse in the morning uh, over lunch, coffee camp. Uh, before we went to sleep, we were rehearsing. So he really helped me a lot with mm -hmm. that. And then by the time we got to do our scenes together, it was just, you know, like talking to each other. Uh, I love working with Rex. He's a great actor. And I, I just get the big, biggest kicks out of the, the way he, the things he chooses and the way he chooses to do a scene and then change it up and do it some other way. I've learned a lot from him. I can definitely see the chemistry uh, on screen between the two. I can see the look in your eyes when you talk about him. I, I love your love story. I saw, I read, you know, a recent article, an interview you did where you called him the love of your life. And I just love the whole love story because I think, you know, there's probably a lot of women who can relate to it, you know, finding love a little bit later in life. They're coming off of a divorce from a, or a long relationship. Maybe they weren't expecting to find love again or not this soon. Like, you know, I guess I wonder if you have any advice for maybe someone who kind of thinks it's not going to happen for them again or at all. And then, you know, boom, here it is. Well, I promise you, I'm the last person you need to start asking love advice <laughs> over being divorced twice. But I wasn't looking for it. Wasn't asking, wasn't looking at all. And we had uh, stayed in contact since we first worked together in 91 on The Gambler with Kenny Rogers. And I was coming to L.A. on 2020 to do Young Sheldon, which he is on Young Sheldon. So is Melissa Peterman. And so he texted me and said, are you coming out to California to do Young Sheldon? And I said, yeah. He said, well, let's have dinner. And I said, OK, we didn't get to do it that time I was in. I came in the next week for other business. And I said, can I take a rain check? I had a long day and I was exhausted. So uh, we all got together, had dinner and uh, in Sherman Oaks and Marnie, my tour manager, I left her out at the valet station. I just had to get in and see Rex. And, you know, I didn't know then that it was a date. Melissa and Marnie said it was a date. They were there with me. And uh, 
so we just we just had a really nice evening and and uh, I hugged his neck goodbye to get in the car with Marnie to go back to the hotel. And I said, uh, come see me. And June 16th, he did. Wow. So like you mentioned that you, you know, had acted together, God, more than 30 years ago now in 91. I know at that time you were, re had recently married. You were practically a newlywed, I believe, to your second husband. But did you sense any sparks at the time? Was there any chemistry when you worked together that, you know, obviously you wouldn't have acted upon, but no, no, really our best friend, uh, mine and Rex is one of our best friend is Ed Gaylord. So we had that mutual, uh, friendship there and we all just kind of stayed in contact. I, I was a part of the Ben Johnson Memorial benefit in, up at, uh, Guthrie, Oklahoma at the Gaylord arena and Red, uh, Rex would be there along with uh, Ben Johnson and Ed Gaylord. And uh, we just all kind of kept the friendship. But timing is everything and everything happens for a reason. How did you know you mentioned a June 16th date? You know, I believe that friendship is a great foundation for a relationship. How and obviously, you know, you are your professional, you know, peers as well. Um, when did you know it was sort of turning into something else? Well, when I went back, uh, that was January of 2020 when we had dinner. And so when I went back to Nashville, uh, we kept texting. Mm -hmm. And then I found out that mama had uh, bladder cancer I'm and sorry. I was texting him and he said, hey, call me anytime if you need to talk. And I just called him and we talked every day. I think that was around the 1st of February and we talked every day since and and uh, because COVID was going on, he couldn't come out to Nashville until June. Mm -hmm. And I've just loved him even more for getting on a plane during the pandemic. So it was true love and it's lasted and we're having more fun now than we did when we first got together. Well, you say you don't give advice, but I mean, I think you're in a good position to give advice. Do you think that when, you know, you experience love at an, you know, an, an older age, uh, that you maybe appreciate more or know, like, you know, maybe mistakes you would have made as a younger person. You kind of know what to do now is what I'm trying to say. Well, it's a good idea to kind of make a mental note of past comments from past relationships about the things you did wrong mm. and analyze that, um, admit if that's right, that it was wrong, what I did and to be a better partner be a better listener, be a more considerate, take more time. Uh, instead of knowing that there's 50,000 things I'd rather be doing maybe, but sit down and visit and watch a football game four in one day. Yes, <laughs> that's true love. <laughs> I'm a bigger fan of football now. That's what's come out of this. But wow. I, I love hanging with Rex. We're good friends. We love each other. And it's just really, really special. And I'm very grateful and thankful to God that he came into my life at this period of my life. I mean, it's, it's the best. Oh, I'm so happy for you. And you. um, like I say, it's, you know, you've been acting for a while you acted to when you acted with him in 91, wasn't that like one of your first things you'd ever done in 91 in as term, in terms of acting? I mean, no, I had done tremors before in 89 and um some other tv shows guest appearances and then uh kenny uh asked me to do the gambler movie and uh chris rich was on that movie the gambler first time i met chris rich and then uh then later on i'm doing uh the reba show with him he's playing my ex-husband so the gambler got a lot of people uh meeting and we've all been friends since then I forgot about Tremors with Kevin Bacon. You're yeah, one degree right away more. from Kevin. You're just one degree away from Kevin Bacon. Do you have any yeah. memories of that? That is a cult classic. That is what a bizarre kind of first acting experience. Weren't you like fighting like worms, underground oh, yeah. worms? <laughs> underground graboids is what they call them. I was touring on the weekend. I was flying back to LA, catching a puddle jumper to Inyo Kearns, driving an hour up to Lone Pine getting into the motel room about three or four o'clock in the morning. They'd come pick me up at five, put me in the trailer and I wouldn't have anything to do till after lunch. So, Oh, I remember it. Well, I even got married. Narla and I got married um, pretty much, I guess the th third week 
uh, we were doing the movie uh, in Lake Tahoe. I did two concerts, got married in the afternoon and had the reception in between shows. It was crazy times. Wow. Well, obviously you've taken on some dramatic roles since then, Big Sky. And of course, this film has, you know, some edgy content. The Hammer does, you know, about, you know, the law, about there's some Me Too stuff in there. There's stuff about drugs and, you know, um, drug reform. And, you know, it's it's uh, I definitely want to talk about that. But since we're talking about dramatic roles, I read that you were supposed to be in Titanic doing the role Molly Brown that um, Kathy Bates ended up doing. And I'm wondering you know, how that didn't happen, you know, it would have kind of been a real interesting career detour for you had you taken, had you been able to do that? I met with James Cameron. I went and auditioned in person and wanted the part really, really bad. And when our schedules didn't line up, I I had to go with my schedule of touring because I had all my band and crew, every, all of the venues already booked. And when they said, no, not these three months, we need these three months, I had to pass because you've got a lot of people's livelihood standing there looking at you. And if we had have moved those dates, well, we wouldn't have gotten the venues that we wanted. So I had to pass on that. Did you have, you know, regrets when obviously it went on to become such a massive film about actually oh, it just sure passed you- its anniversary, 25th anniversary? Sure you do. You say, wow, I wished I could have, but you have to take care of your people. And they were number one. Hmm, okay. Well, that, you know, I just I just wondered because I'm I mean, that's kind of not a role that people would have thought maybe for you back then. Now, you know, uh, with things like the hammer, I'm curious, um, have you made a conscious effort to try to take on more like darker roles or more dramatic roles? Uh huh. Um, Big Sky is one of them when uh <laughs> Elwood Reed called me. We were on Zoom, and he said, "I've got an idea for you to be a, uh, on the next season of Big Sky." And I said, "Okay, what is it?" And when he told me, I said, "I'm in. Uh, that's exactly what I've been looking for: something dark, something sinister, mystery." And I've had a blast with it. Rex and I loved working on Big Sky, and um, we, it's, it was just so much fun. It's it's something different than I've ever done before. Why is I guess, were you concerned about being typecast as a person who does more like comedy or whatever? Like, why have you wanted to pursue these kind of roles? Just to do something different, more challenging. And it was, it is, it's, it's just so much fun to go dark. You know, I'm known as a very bubbly Mm -hmm. up-tempo person and to go into that dark place is just, it was just interesting. It was fun, fun to play with. So tell me a bit about, you know, with, um, you know, sort of the subject matter of the hammer, how do you think your fans will kind of react to, you know, there's some heavy, I mean, there are, there are comedic moments in it, of course, you know, but there's some heavy stuff in this film. Uh I think they'll get a kick out of it. I think they'll fall in love with, with uh, Judge Kim, the way I did. Uh, She's got strong points. She's a very fierce woman, uh, very practical, um, you know where she stands. So I think they'll get a kick out of it. I'm curious because as as I alluded to, there's some kind of Me Too storyline. I don't want to give too much away, obviously, because you know people are going to watch it. But there's a storyline in it where like a man who is basically in a position of authority, of power, um, wants sexual favors from younger women who are not in power uh, with promises that'll help them out if they oblige or that, there'll be consequences punishment if they do not and obviously it's a a timely storyline but i'm i'm wondering just in your career as a as a woman in country if you maybe not anything that extreme but like you know we hear so much about how it's you know even nowadays it's such a hard time for women in country have you dealt with any kind of that sexism and if so how did you overcome that no i didn't i didn't ever have uh, but I I came from a man's world, ranching, rodeo, um, and I realized early on that you work harder, you don't bitch and complain, you just work harder and you do, you prove yourself. Uh, bitching will not get you anywhere, it, you're just a whiny, complaining little lady if you do that. So <laughs> you just go get in there, you do your job, you show up, you're on time, you do your work, and you're prepared, and you prove that you are worth uh, what you say you are. 
you know, if I want this amount of money to go perform, uh, you're only worth as many butts as you can put in the seat is what they used to tell me. But things have changed so much for women in the music business. Um, I've been watching the George and Tammy uh, mm. uh, limited series, absolutely loving it. And what uh, Loretta, Tammy, Dolly, Kitty Wells all went through way before my time, um, we're light years ahead of what they had to deal with. And hats off to them. And I thank them so much for the roads that they paved for all of us girl singers nowadays. I was actually going to ask you if you think things are harder, easier for women in country now than when you were coming up, as I alluded to a few minutes ago, you know, your success wasn't overnight. You had to grind for a bit because you hear those headlines all the time. And when I think of what I remember for me at my age is the golden age of country. It's all women. It's like you, Shania Twain, Trisha Yearwood, Faith Hill, the Dixie, the chicks, um, you know, it was for me, it was all dominated by women. So it's so surprising to me to see that, you know, women struggle at country radio. There's that whole like tomatoes with the lettuce analogy that happened a couple of <laughs> years ago. Do you think it's harder now or easier now than when you were sort of coming up? It's cyclical. It will run the gambit for a little while with the women and then the men take control. Then it's contemporary. Then it's more traditional. I think a song will make a difference for anybody. Mm. That great song will, uh, it don't care what gender, race, color, creed you are. It's a great song. If you can sing it, it'll take you where you need to go. So I think if talent wins out, that's the most important thing. That makes a lot of sense. There's one other thing I want to ask sort of talking about. It's sort of, it kind of touch, checks a lot of the boxes what we're talking about. Progress in country, how you may have been typecast or whatever, maybe some sexism is I realized that we're coming up on the 30th anniversary of the CMA awards. And I don't remember this firsthand, but I've read that when you wore what I think was a perfectly appropriate red dress, <laughs> like there, it was a scandal in Nashville that you were wearing like a, I guess what they consider to be a sexy dress. Can you do what happened? What was the story there? Well, the story was Sandy Speaker had made it for me and we ha had one fitting at the office. And I said, now, Sandy, you are going to fill this in here, aren't you? She said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to fill in. Ryan's going to be real sparkly. I said, great. So we were at the Grand Ole Opry House and I tried it on and I looked in the mirror and I said, Sandy, this is still really low cut. She said, I think it's the lighting in here. I said, OK. So I walked down the hall and I was going to go stage left. And Chris Christopherson is walking towards me and he goes, wow, you look beautiful tonight. I said, thank you so much. Yeah, it's OK. So I've got stage left and I'm getting ready and I walk out first and I hear the crowd go. Mm. And I thought, dang, I look good. And you Susie did. said she and mama were in the audience and mama just grabbed her arm and said, oh, Susie. And so I sang the song. Here comes Linda Davis out. She does her part. And it's all over. So we go after the show, we go back to the office and meet up with mom and daddy and everybody. And daddy comes over to me. He said, Reba, did you have that dress on backwards? So I guess it was a little low. Yeah, but honestly, I mean, maybe I'm looking at it through the context of award show dresses now. Oh, like now, shoot, that's that's grainy stuff compared <laughs> to what, it, well, back then, no, I was pretty, you know, straight laced and it, I'm sure it shocked everybody that I would do a low dress. It, it was pretty scandalous for me. What was the reaction to, obviously, maybe thankfully there was no social media then, but, <laughs> or internet for that matter, really, but like, surely it got back to you. Was, was there any kind of backlash to it or anything like that? No, not that I remember. If there was, they didn't tell me about it, but uh, yeah, everybody was just surprised. Did you regret? Anybody, I don't think anybody burned my records or anything. That's good. So you didn't regret wearing it or anything? You oh, didn't no, think? no, 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 no. Do you still have the dress? Oh, absolutely. Matter of fact, I wore it uh, when I think Kelly Clarkson and I did Does He Love You on the CMAs a few years ago. Oh my God. And the fact, the fact that you can still fit, that's... <laughs> <laughs> you're doing you're doing something right you're doing something right so Thank what did 
what advice do you have for women in country? I mean, you sort of imparted, especially ones who maybe want to branch out as you have, you do so many other things, you know, you act, you have your podcast, you have your lifestyle book, you got a lot of things going on, which I think is important. Um, brand is everything, but you know, you've, you fought some battles and it seems like for you, it didn't even feel like a fight. You just much like Kim, you just charged in and did it. What advice do you have for maybe women in country? And they also do have to contend with all this social media crap and stuff now, which you didn't have to back, back when you were starting out. The thing I had, the, the best advice I was ever given by Walter Scott, a good friend of mine from Omaha, Nebraska. I asked him one day, I said, Walter, you've done it all. What advice would you give me? He said, have fun. Simple advice, but you definitely took a lot of control over your career as, as it progressed in terms of, you know, I, I, you know, and I've read about your early career in terms of the songs that you sing, obviously how you present yourself, you met you taking, you know, control of your own management, stuff like that. Do you feel that's like, it, again, I'm seeing the parallels. That's why the very first question I asked was the parallels to the Kim character and sort of like, you know being in charge of everything and not caring what other people think, that sort of thing. Well, I agree with Dolly Parton 100%. You need to take care of yourself. Nobody's going to take as good care of you as you are going to take care of yourself because you know what you can do, what you're able to do, what you're willing to do. And when something doesn't feel right, you need to stand up for yourself and say, no, I don't want to do that. I have uh, passed on a lot of things as the Titanic, which I knew in my heart was the right thing to do for my people. Probably for me too. Uh, Kathy Bates did an outstanding job and I'm very fortunate and glad to say I got to tell her that in person. But I think if you know what you want to do and then your gut tells you that you need to do this and everybody's against it, just bide your time, wait for the right moment, pick your battles and go for it. Because God gave you a voice, God gave you a brain and he gave you a talent. Talk to him about it. I do. And he'll give you the timing to pursue what you need to pursue. And he'll give you the energy and the words to say it. Awesome. Great advice. So what are you pursuing next? You know, you have the, the hammer coming out and you have all these other projects. What's next on the horizon for you? We've got a lot of plates spinning in the air. A lot of more acting things that were, it's in development. We've got a tour coming up March and April that we're really looking forward to. We're getting to play the Hollywood Bowl and Madison Square Garden, which I've not headlined before in my career. So we're looking forward to things like that and just enjoying life, spending more time doing things. This this year, this past year, 2021, 2022, was a very busy year. And this year, I think, is a, a little bit more set back and enjoy the what's going on around me. Did you ever expect that, you know, more than three decades um, into your career, into, you know, your adulthood that um, that you'd be thriving so much? I mean, obviously your love life is thriving, you know, more than it probably ever has your career. I mean, the Madison Square Garden, Hollywood Bowl, you know, this far into your career. I mean, congratulations on all that. Did you foresee this kind of future for yourself? Because some people, you know, aren't so fortunate to have to be kind of like living their best life this far into their life. Thank you for that. I'm very thankful, very grateful, and absolutely no, I did not think even three years ago I'd be as busy as I am now, but I love being busy. I love to work. Rex and I both love to work, and but I like to play hard too. I love to go on vacations. I love to see the world and we're going to do a little bit of that too now that we've worked so hard in 2022 but boy when the job offers come in if it's something that you really want to do we'll be doing it any more if they let us i think they'll let you and before i let you go any more acting for you and rex besides big sky and any other projects together well, there's projects there's projects and then there's projects together that are possible uh, it just depends on timing and what is he offered? What am I offered? You know, a, a role that he's been dying for to do might come up when something we have together. Then we'll have to make that decision. Which one do we go with? Does he sing? He does sing. Maybe a duets album. Just you like want to hear our too. birthday message. We do a mean happy birthday duet. 
<laughs> but there's no like George and Tammy situation. There's probably not going to be a a duets album in your future, or maybe, maybe you just never know. You never know because the bongos or the drums while I'm singing, he can do that for sure. Maybe I'll see him on stage with you at the Hollywood Bowl. You know, there you go. There you go. In the meantime, he's obviously on screen with you in the hammer and um, congratulations on this film and everything you got going on. It's really your, your whole life is so inspiring. Oh, thank you so much. We've had a blast and looking forward to seeing what 2023 is going to bring our way. Me and too. I hope you have a wonderful year too. Oh, thank you, Reba. Same to you and to Rex. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed speaking with you. My pleasure. Good visiting with you too. Okay. Bye fellow redhead. <laughs>